university has not done you any favours when it comes to effective legal writing. And it's not on purpose. I'm not suggesting that university is evil or that they're trying to train up generation after generation of lawyer who can't possibly string words together without it being incomprehensible gibberish, but that is the outcome that is occurring. And in a sense, it's inadvertent, but they really could do something about it. So instead of letting them get around to it, I'm going to fix it. And I'm not talking here about dot points. I'm not talking about headings. I'm not talking about grammar. We will get to those things possibly, but what we're going to talk about is the nature in which you communicate and the nature of the information you've consumed throughout the course of your law degree. So when you started your law degree and you did your introduction to law topic or whatever the first thing on day one was, you probably accumulated some textbooks and then you started reading. Now, what did you read as you went through your law degree? You read cases written by judges delivering reasons for decision. You read textbooks written by academics or sometimes by practitioners, and they are written in a way to communicate information to you, but to communicate legal information to you. They are designed to be a resource. They might be a dictionary. You might have a citation guide. You might have a contracts textbook. Perhaps you have a cases and statutes summary book. Perhaps you have a copy of legislation which is another category of thing that you read. You read legislation, which again is written with a particular purpose in mind. It is designed to set down the law in a way that hopefully can be understood by someone without necessarily having a brain surgery degree. Sometimes they succeed, sometimes they don't. However, these are the kinds of information that you have been consuming throughout the course of your law degree. And you have listened to lectures and you have heard things delivered in a particular style. And what do you do with that information? Well, you utilize that information in order to pass your subjects, don't you? So you do assignments and you do exams. Those are the fundamentals of law school assessment, despite the fact that they're not very good ways of assessing things, that is how it is still done. I'm sure you had some sort of practical element. This is the 21st century. Maybe you had to do some sort of mock client interview. Maybe you had to do some sort of moot where you pretended to be a barrister in front of a judge or something like that. But by and large, the vast majority of your assessment was probably written and it was probably assessment by assignment or assessment by exam. And how were those exams set out? Those exams were set out in a particular way as a rule. They would provide you with a scenario or perhaps a question and they would ask you to answer the question. So it might be Bobby and Susie went for a walk, Bobby tripped on the road. Does Bobby has, have a cause of action against Susie for negligence for failing to hold his hand? And then you have to go through the tort of negligence. And the question is not actually designed to, they don't just want the answer because you could answer that question, yes. Naturally, they want your reasoning. And so the result of what they are asking you to do, whether it's assignment or exam, is that they want you to demonstrate the knowledge that you have so that they can go, yes, this person grasps the nature of the tort of negligence, or this person understands the basics of the GST law, or this person really grasps whatever other topic we want to get to. And so you got in the habit of writing your assignments and writing your exam answers in a way that demonstrated that you knew the knowledge, in a sense, coming up with the right answer was secondary and you wouldn't necessarily lose that many marks if you arrived at a different conclusion because the questions were specifically designed to test your knowledge of the law and not necessarily be answerable in a yes or no way. So what you would do if you were faced with a question, let's say it's a breach of contract question, is that you would answer it in the following way. You would say first, is there a contract? Here are the basic elements of contract offer, acceptance and consideration. And they were present in this case because such and such did this and so and so did that and there was this consideration passing both ways. And so I believe there was a legally binding contract upon the parties. They appeared to have an intention to form legal relations and so I'm comfortable with that conclusion. Then there has been a breach. Was it a breach of a term or a condition or a warranty or something else? And then you work through and then you look at damages and you look at what damages are available and you look at remedies and you say it can't be this and it can't be that and it can't be that but it might be this and you're doing that because you are in your head working through the process of elimination and you're putting that down on paper so that your marker can go this person understands the area of law 
However, that is a terrible way of communicating with clients. And it's a terrible way of communicating with the court. And it's a terrible way of communicating with other parties. Because what's happened is this, you're being marked according to a set of objective criteria that are designed to test your knowledge of the law. There are some elements of cohesion there, of course, but by and large, you could write something that would score 100% marks for your law degree, but that would get thrown in the bin by a client if delivered to them. The difficulty is that clients do not mark you on an objective criteria. They mark you on a subjective criteria. Clients want answers to their questions. They don't care how much law you know, and they don't care how good your reasoning process is. As a general rule, they want to know what is the answer and what are my risks. That is what they're engaging you for as a lawyer if you're writing to them. Similarly, the other parties to litigation, perhaps, or the other parties in a conveyance don't care how much you know about the applicable legislation. You might need to spell something out to them every time, but you don't necessarily want to write your entire reasoning process down. However, what you have gotten in the habit of doing is in documenting those things. As you write your case notes, as you write your exams, as you write your assignments, you have gotten in a habit of writing in a particular way. That is not the style that is necessarily appropriate as you come to drafting in the real world. And so that's how university has inadvertently trained you to write incorrectly. But that's okay, because you're taking this course. And now that you're live to this issue, you can start considering it right from now. We're going to look in the next lesson at the core fundamentals of effective legal drafting. And we're going to see how those don't necessarily appear in university assignments. Now, this is not to bag out university assignments. This is just to highlight the distinction. University assignments serve a purpose, but effective legal drafting might serve a different purpose. And that's what we're going to be exploring as part of this course. So now you understand why you're inclined to write the way you are. And awareness is the first step in solving the problem. In the next lesson, we're going to take a look at the strategies behind effective legal drafting.